let's move on to to involution because I think yeah I think it sets up this this trans this uh excuse me this transition nicely. Um, so, so again, I'll do cognizing involution. Cognizing involution, yeah. So of all the integral concepts that you've put forth in your work, involution remains for many people one of the most difficult to think about and communicate. While evolution unfolds over time, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Ken, we yeah. often think of involution as a moment-to-moment -moment process, a constant sort of atemporal condensation of causal energies into the subtle and then again into the gross, which is why we sometimes say stages evolve and states involve. And this is a process that began presumably alongside the Big Bang itself. I mean, hell, it might even be the event that precipitated the Big Bang for all we it know was. right now. It, it was. was. Yeah. Mm. However, when, when I think of this interpenetration of evolution and involution, one unfolding in time while the other is sort of infolding at every moment, it leaves me with a couple questions. If the Big Bang was predicated by causal energies involving into subtle and subtles then, subtle energies then involving into gross, then this would mean that these subtle energy realms already existed at the very first moments of the Big Bang. If that's the case, then what exactly were the contents of these realms before evolution had an opportunity to generate corresponding subtle and causal forms? Was it just a gentle trail? of involutionary givens and a few square roots of negative one floating around. In other words, it took a few billion years before the first yep. cell emerged in the universe that was capable of generating or transmitting the simplest yep. form of subtle matter, matter energy. Before right. that cell emerged, did these subtle and causal realms exist purely as a vacuum or as some sort of potentials within an unmanifest probability space or what is the best way for us to sort of imagine what the what the contents of these subtle and right. causal spaces were we before evolution go, had a chance to catch up right we have to go back to the start and start with the very beginning mm. and according to the great traditions spirit just being self-contained itself and spaceless, timeless, however you want to think of it, basically unqualifiable. Mm -hmm. But spirit blew out of itself in order to create the world. I mean, the world came from someplace, and most of the traditions say, yeah, it, it's a product of spirit's creation. Okay, so how does spirit create? And if you read tucked away in a really quite large number of meditative texts, the Lankavatara Sutra, um, various Upanishads, things like that, you'll find the whole involutionary arc drawn out. Because it'll say, let me, I'm going to use the Christian version of the great chain of being. It's got some problems with it, but everybody knows what the words mean. And so it's useful. Matter, body, mind, soul, spirit. And the difference between matter and body in the great chain is body means the living body. So it's matter in there, in the great chain to you, is what existed before any life form evolved or emerged so it's truly dead matter mm -hmm. and sentient dead matter and then matter arranges itself in complex forms to form a living body now the living body cannot itself be reduced to just dead material forms if you do that it would die right. so there's something new added there's a new degree of complexity and reality added with the body. But the first bodies, you can even say the first bodies of a deer or the bodies of a caveman weren't terribly bright. So you take a caveman, he's not thinking how to do calculus problems and stuff like that. So you've got this caveman 
and he's in a living body and he's starting to develop a mind, which would be a great leap of the third great level in the overall great chain of matter, body, mind, soul, spirit. So mind is starting to emerge and by 10,000 BC, 5,000 BC, certainly right around BC to AD itself, you start to get humans who are proficient at thinking. And they, you can give a greater breakdown of that if you use subtler versions of this great chain, like Gene Gepsu's archaic to magic, to mythic, to rational, to pluralistic, to integral. But you can simply think those are tucked in there if you like, because they all are. But so you get mind, and that's a new and higher level. Mind can't be reduced to just body. It's a new and higher level in itself. And then people with mind who started to investigate their own mind, mm -hmm. look into themselves, even start to meditate, they started having spiritual experiences. And this was coming from the soul. And so they would get Satori and Zen would emerge. And the, the first thing a Zen master will tell you is that Satori cannot be reduced to just rational mind. It won't work. Mm -hmm. So there's another increasing higher stage. And it does have certain qualities that are not found in mind or body or matter. And then soul can, at the very highest of its spiritual experience, have a union with spirit. And they, so they've actually returned to spirit. And that's taken to be a great enlightenment or a full awakening or whatever term you want to use for that. Mm -hmm. So there are five levels of existence. And according to the tradition, when spirit blew itself out, it, it just did it in a kind of step-down fashion. So it blew itself out and created a step-down version of itself called soul. And then soul blew itself out and created a step-down version called mind. Mm -hmm. And mind blew itself out and created a step-down version called body. And the body blew itself out and created a step-down version called matter. And when that step happened, the big bang blew into existence. So that's where the notion of evolution starts. Is it starts with, well, wait, we have an existing world. Mm -hmm. Where did it come from? It came from spirit. Well, how did spirit do that? Did it just sneeze and all of a sudden, all of today, came into existence or did it start and go all the way down to the lowest it could find, which is what even uh, self-awareness or consciousness or anything like that. And it just, there it clunked itself out, so to speak. And we got the big bang. And the big bang started with just matter no bodies, no living bodies, no mind, no soul, no spirit, just bodies. And they started moving forward in evolution because since everything came ultimately from spirit, every single hole on in existence has this drive, this desire, this force, this energy to return to spirit. And so that's what matter does. And given the density of these levels, like mat, um, living body is smarter than dead matter. And so once it comes on the scene, evolution goes a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. And then 
it produced mind and mind was smarter than body. And so its evolution went a little bit faster and then souls and then spirits. So what was existing in the evolutionary trail is just think about it yourself for a few minutes. If spirit had just blown itself outward and all it was creating at first were these step down levels of reality, then what would be in those levels and how much of them would be present? Mm -hmm. So let's say from the Big Bang. So what we got is this whole string of step down realities. And you say, well, where do they exist? I go, well, they're unconscious. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they, they, they don't pop out in awareness at every stage. So they're definitely, in some sense, unconscious. One of the things we start finding is that as human beings evolve to higher and higher stages, some of them can have advanced leap into even higher stages. So by the time we get to mind, we have some individuals that are having meditative experiences all the way to soul. And some are actually experiencing a direct spirit and a union with that. So these stages, these levels of awareness are available. Mm. But for the most part, they're simply unconscious strings of reality. So they're really there because that's how the world got created is by this throwing out and stepping down process. And that's what the involutionary process is. It's this whole string of potential realizations that human beings or any other animal can move up as far as it potentials take it. And those will be determined by the degree of evolution they've already undergone. Mm -hmm. So something that's evolved to the living body level can even if it's starting out as a cell, it's a little zygote cell, it can intuit, or however you want to think about it, the fact that it's going to a living body fullness. Mm -hmm. And that would be the push and pull that, I mean, we already know that evolution as random chance and necessity that's nowhere near mathematically dense enough to produce anything resembling right. evolution. I mean, they, I saw the mathematics on what it would take to just take 150 amino acids and put them together in a chain to make a protein, a single protein, but it would have to be put together correctly. And if you're just mixing stuff up randomly, there's a billion ways you can mix 150. And so what they came out with was the chance of getting all the sequences right in 50 atoms to make a single protein strand. The chances of getting that right over the chances of getting that wrong Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, the chances of getting it wrong or the chances of getting it right are one over 10 to the 77th. It's a big number. The big number. <laughs> the number of organisms on the entire planet are one over um, 10 to the 56, something like that. So the chances of strict neo-Darwinian evolution with chance mutation and natural selection that actually produce all of the diversity we see, it's way, way over impossible. Right. So you've got to account for that. 
And by the way, multiple universes won't do it. And several other things that they're trying to think of to handle it won't do it. Um, they're simply going to have to, like Stuart Kaufman and the Santa Fe Institute, they're simply, and a lot of other scientists are starting to use specifically this term for arrows, they use self-organization. Mm -hmm. And the universe has self-organization as another drive inherent in it, just like gravity, electromagnetic, strong, weak nuclear, plus self-organization. Right. And that at least gives a bit of a pull right. that you can count on. Um, so that's what involution is doing. Right. And it's it, they don't just need one pull, one big pull to get life started, and then you can fall back to chance mutation and this natural selection. You have to have it in at least, I can't remember, something like 77 other major life forms. Right. You have to have the same amount of creativity to get each of those out of its predecessor. And so that's what the involutionary drive is doing. It's there as a drive. You don't have to think of it as coming down moment to moment or something like that. It's just a tension that was started when spirit threw itself out and it went all the way down to the lowest level it could find and crashed out and stopped. And as soon as it stopped, because each particle has a desire to return to its own home, it started moving back. And that's also a problem that physicists have a little bit of trouble explaining. But that's see it. And it all just came from is there is spirit or there isn't spirit. It's just very simple. There is a ground of being or there is not a ground to be. And if you say, okay, I'll just start with, I think there is a spirit. I think there's a ground of all being. I think there's a great ground of all being. Then if that's the case, and there is creation, what's the relation between them? Mm -hmm. I mean, because apparently spirit produced the world of creatures and finite matter and manifestation and all of that. And so all of the great traditions have some version of this concept of, yes, spirit threw itself outward in a play, a maya, a great illusory separation, because all of these levels of the great chain still have at their core essence spirit so it's spirit as matter spirit as body spirit mm -hmm. as mind spirit as soul and spirit as spirit so those are all still there and you can just think of them as just this long stretch and however you want to think about that is sort of up to you i'll add some more of my own thoughts on it as we go along but um it's really simple. Is, is there spirit or is there not? If there is, then how does creation come about? Mm -hmm. If so, how about this version? It's really the simplest version you can get from spirit to a material world. It's spirit goes down, spirit returns. Yep. But the nice thing about that is that both of these sequences can be altered by the manifest realm as it goes forward. So one of the things that happens as spirit is creating matter and then matter itself is starting to return and is creating its own more complex holons, um, quarks, protons, neutrons, atoms, and so on and then up into molecules and molecules into cells, cells into organisms, um, is that by the time we get to mind, 
one of the things that's happening as is because there's a great deal of freedom in individual holons and how they interact, um, the spirit did not create a deterministic world. Right. right. Um, so as human minds start to create like civilizations and stuff like that, then those forms end up when a human being dies and returns to ground, then its forms are released into this overall up and down chain. And so matter or mind, which is passed on to every human being, becomes more and more saturated with the forms of its own existence. And so it's going to pass on those forms to future humans. Mm. So as the mind level goes from just a sort of an abstract um, stopping ground on the way as spirit threw itself out, it can become much more complex as human beings learn mathematics, for example, and they have forms that go from arithmetic to mm -hmm. algebra, to geometry, to calculus, those are all forms that would be stored in the mind. And therefore, as spirit throws itself out continually, it's going to go down and it's going to pick up all of those mental forms. And right. they're going to be in the chain waiting right. for the first hold on that evolves back to the mind level. And then those are going to all be potentials for, or in this case, a human being to express because that's now the form of its own mind. It's going to have those potentials in it. Um, real, real brief, Ken, I just want to see yeah. if, this, if, 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 this is, if this holds up. So again, I'm having the image of the magnet in the fields and the iron filings. Um, I think about this in terms of, I mean, what you're saying makes a lot of sense because two plus two equals four. That was true before the very first mind evolved capable of cogniz cognizing that truth. Sure. And in uh, fact, the, 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 the fact that two plus two equals four actually helps influence the eventual evolution of a a mind that's capable of seeing that in the first place. So again, it's yeah, almost like it also it had to be in existence someplace. Yeah, exactly. For the big man. Exactly. Exactly. Because you had to have two plus two equals four. That's right. That's right. And then in terms of how these two layers, you know, because we're, we're talking about randomness on the one side versus something that looks a little bit more curated, maybe, you know, spiritually curated yeah. in a certain kind of sense. And again, it reminds me of the iron filings. You can take, yeah, if you have a magnet underneath a piece of paper, you can take a bunch of iron filings and just throw them up in the air and they're going to come down randomly, right? There's no deterministic process to determining where those filings are going. However, right. once they start coming down, the magnetic field starts influencing their behavior. It starts influencing right. where exactly they're going to land so that chances are you're going to have an image that looks just like these magnetic fields. It seems like right. the same thing. So it's kind of, it brings us back to the 20 tenets where you're talking about the lower determines the possibilities of the higher, the higher determines the probabilities of the lower. And here, this it's is exactly what we're saying. We're seeing exactly the, the modification of probability fields, which doesn't mean that randomness doesn't exist. It right. means that there's another, there's another layer that is actually influencing the probabilistic or the indeterminism that's occurring on the junior level, yeah. which is freaking fascinating. Yeah. And they have to be those sort of mathematical laws have to be in existence when as it continues to go down yep. but humans will they'll become obvious only when humans develop a mental capacity that can discover the right. mathematics that's already in the universe and that immediately takes care of the problem 
of, well, where is mathematics? How come it's so amazingly universal and all of this kind of stuff? And the involutionist, evolutionist answers, well, it was produced by spirit. Mm. And so you do get at least a kind of a hint of why intelligent designers always run into problems that they say, oh, only an intelligence can yeah. fix. This. Out of the gaps. And that's the sort of interesting part of their theories. The bummer of their theories is most of them for intellect simply insert Jehovah. <laughs> and they say, oh, that's the intelligence. Yeah. But I mean, it, that's not right at all. But, I mean, because not only every single thing in evolution is designed, as Mike Murphy says, evolution meanders more than it progresses. Right. And so there is still a chance. And that means you don't have to have an intelligent designer as a actual separate thing watching every single evolutionary unfolding i mean the only way an intelligent designer would have produced the duckbill platypus is if it got drunk that week yeah i mean that's it's just it's crazy and can i i don't know about you but i breathe and i eat using the same hole and that just seems dangerous yeah it, that's right there are so many things that just don't seem intelligently designed especially when you start going downstairs <laughs> yeah right uh, there's some things um, in proximity that feel like they shouldn't be in proximity <laughs> right it's a mess it's a mess but it works fine if you have it as an implicit structure of the existing universe mm -hmm. I, I i i love the idea that the fact that two plus two equals four is going to guarantee the eventual evolution of a mind capable of understanding that two plus two equals four. It's not yeah. going to generate a mind that sees two plus two equals five. It's going yeah. to generate a mind that sees the universe for what it is. And then we can actually right. start seeing this, this downward, again, modification of probability fields on a junior level. Um, which is, it's fascinating, Ken, because when we talk about the 20 tenets, usually we're talking about like again the particles the holons that have already manifested and here's the relationship they have with each other but here we're kind of talking about holons that have manifested versus future holons that kind of want to manifest but haven't yet and yeah. yet the fields are still are still there yeah i'm um, still yeah. pulling reality up in a certain kind of way um that's right and that's what evolution and involution that's how they work together mm. Involution is this, in a sense, it's this steady downward push, but it's also a pull upward. Right. Because each involutionary element that's just a fraction of a bit higher in that direction is going to exert a pull on lower hole on. And that's where we see um, a subtle energy that is manifesting as a pull to organize the atoms or the molecules or the cells, whatever are, are there, into a higher order unity. And that unity and with, has and always has increasing complexity, increasing wholeness, and increasing consciousness. That's just the way it works. And every single element that's evolved has all three of those. And that's because there are these higher implicit gradients in the chain of involution. And so that um, is exactly how I think that works. Mm. Um, I used to always even very generalized statements about this, like Houston Smith, um, who was a very, very bright guy, he would always say things like, well, in evolution, they always have these questions about how can you get mind out of body or how can you get the higher out of the lower? And they just can't figure it out. 
And he says, but it's easy. You get the higher out of the lower because the higher was put into place before the lower. And it's already there as an effective force. So no matter how many details get added to mind, it still has its basic forms and its basic forces that are operating. Mm. And all of that comes from the evolution, evolutionary cycle. Beautiful. Beautiful. So I think it's really important. It is. It is. And there's a, there's so much to unpack in. And we'll probably, you know, talk about involution several more times in episodes to come simply because it is um, so, I mean, part of it feels really, really intuitive. And part of it feels like it's, it's, it's hard to kind of reframe it because we're so used to thinking about these things in, an, in, a, in a temporal, unfolding, right. evolutionary way. And this just kind right. of gives a different... A different kind of angle on it um yeah it's yeah. like you take a magnet and put it, it and you have a timeline that goes up here and you're right here in the timeline right. and you take a big magnet from behind and you put it in front right and right. then watch what happens yeah and what happens is happens to match with exactly what evolution has given us so far yes. so none of this one to over 10 to the 77th power <laughs> of impossibility right. that's just outrageous see that would be if you just threw the iron file filings and there was no magnetic field and they just happened to fall perfectly in the shape that that's the type of astronomic probabilities that you're talking about there right. so clearly there's something organizing it and i want to point people to i think you have two pieces of writing that come to mind as you're talking ken i think they're both in one taste one of them is sort of a a parable or an allegory that you use to talk about involution, where it's basically imagine you're God, all knowing, all being, all present, etc. That's going to get pretty fucking boring pretty quickly. So right. what are you going to want to do? You're going to want to play a game, but you can't play a game with yourself because that's also boring. So you right. manifest a universe, forget who you are. And yeah. the goal of the game is to remember. Right. And then you have a, another piece also in one taste, which is gorgeous, called um, anamnesis, right? Um, the opposite of amnesia, basically right. the, the remembering of spirit. And like the first part is just physical, gross energy, crash, pull, bang, or something like that. Right. Um, right. And then it goes up through these layers all the way back up to, uh, to you know, full enlightened right. awakening. Um, it's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. So Kepler started measuring all the planetary motions yeah. and came up with laws governing that. Galileo started measuring earthly motions, same as dropping stuff out of lean therapies and all that. Came up with laws of terrestrial motion. And then the super genius Isaac Newton tied both those together with universal laws of, of gravity and, and, and force and motion. Um, and that was, um, that was an extraordinary step forward. And it really was holistically oriented. I mean, Charles Taylor points out that the most common concept in the Western Enlightenment is what the French philosophers call the system de la nature, the system of nature. It's this interwoven, interlocking, single, vast, universal whole system. John Locke even called it the great interlocking order. Yeah. And that's what it was. Yeah. And they weren't trying to be reductionistic at first, because the second most common idea in the Western Enlightenment, according to Arthur Lovejoy, was the great chain of being. Okay, yeah. And the Christian version, that's yeah. matter, body, yeah. mind, soul, yeah. spirit. And so all these Enlightenment philosophies were out measuring everything. And unfortunately, in that chain, it's really easy to measure matter. That's, it's yes, not it's easy, easy to it's, measure body, feelings. And, 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 and easy to make it repeat. Well, not easy to get it to repeat. It's like, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's it, it, I can pretty much guarantee this will keep falling, but I have no yeah. idea what you're going to say next. Yeah, well, it, they didn't think that they were being reductionistic because they, they all believed in this great chain of being. That wasn't a problem. They just yeah. assumed it was all still out there. Yeah. But they were measuring it. So they did come up with the idea that everything is interwoven, is these vast interlocking systems of objective measurable material things. In other words, the lower right quadrant, that's what was real. So everything sort of got reduced to that. And even though they themselves didn't do it with a century or two of that, everybody using that system had just completely left yeah. out interiors because they weren't measuring them. They weren't part of the scheme. They weren't coming up with any laws or rules or regulations doing that. 
um, even if you track um, just the objective exterior third person scientific account of evolution, there is something called the second law of thermodynamics. And it does say if you take a chunk of the physical universe, cut it off, put it in a box, and watch it, it runs down. Yeah. And that's fine. I mean, if you put a drop of ink in a glass of water, it will disperse. It, it won't drop like that. But if you put that physical thing back in with the rest of the physical universe and watch it for a billion years or so, it winds up. Yeah. And so uh, the, that dispersed thing did come together into drops called living cells. Yeah. So we went from these some you know strings or whatever it was back there, and then quarks, and then quarks came together into subatomic particles. Subatomic particles came together into whole atoms. Whole atoms came together into molecules. Whole molecules came together into cells. Cells into multicellular organisms. That's winding up. Yeah. And that's um, and Ilya Pershing got the Nobel Prize for demonstrating that even in matter itself dead and sentient non-living matter has a tendency to create order out of chaos. And you take a material system, push it far from equilibrium, and it will escape that tension by jumping to a higher level of real order. The example I always use is if you're just running water down down a sink and it's just all chaotic and all of a sudden it makes a whirlpool. It just spontaneously jumps into an order state. And it's often just called order out of chaos. But the point was that that's inherent in the material universe. That's going all the way back to the Big Bang. And so if there is this drive to greater unity, greater wholeness, yeah. greater inclusivity, yep. those all start sounding a lot like love. And at the very least, you can certainly say there is, I mean, if you're going to have any sort of notion of... So the thing which was starting creating those primitive holons is going to end up as love. And, and, and some... Not all, but some metaphysicians would say, yeah, and those things are um, potentials in Saguna uh -huh. Brahman. Uh, not Nirguna Brahman, but Nirguna, for one reason you can't say it doesn't have anything potential because it doesn't lack anything that needs to manifest and become actual. Everything about ultimate reality is real. It doesn't have parts that's, that, that's still. That's just the, the, the point about... Um, well, Aristotle's unmoved mover, it, it doesn't have any potentiality in it um, because it's already fully actualized. It, it can't be just an acorn and also be the ground of all, it has to be a full oak. Okay. It's just going to be. Right. <laughs> yeah, like, kind of. But Saguna, with these qualities of capital love, capital being, capital consciousness, um, that's a different story, and and you can either see, well, okay, some of the things that this infinite ground of all being, it is giving rise to everything moment to moment. So, what what's that the process actually? How's that actually occur? And one of the common views is that at least in just these broad realms, of this great chain of being, this matter to body to mind to soul to spirit yeah. that as spirit throws itself out to create something as yeah. this mystery actually starts to take a form yeah then it the only way it can go is down so it steps down a bit and creates this thing called soul okay so do you go with this i know it's the structure no, of i'll being. tell you in, in a bit okay because it, and then I want soul the, throws right. itself out to create a so that's, form that's called the... mind and it forgets what it's doing, and yeah, the mind throws yeah, itself out to create yeah. body, and body throws itself out to create matter, and bang, there's the Big Bang. And, you're in, yeah. and at the Big Bang, there are no living bodies, there are no conceptual minds, there's no living so, souls. So my problem with matter. that is, yeah, but why would you say that? Whereas if you go for just this one process of it starting with the most primitive, even if it's happened before, even if it's repeating what other universes have done. It's just building on the past like this moment is. It's building on the past as a birth of the new universe and it's starting some, the, the, the whole, and that actually it looks like soul, psyche, or, these are coming last. They're not there in first. And what would that mean that they're there first? And so it seems to lack that, it's like you're, putting, you're picking something up and just putting it at the beginning, like you put God at the beginning, rather well, than say, you know, one of the things about the, why I like the word potentiality is you can, it feels like you can, justifiably put it at the beginning because sure. it must well, be there otherwise would, it couldn't come from it so that would be so do you think that do you go with that for if you're 
what I believe about that whole movement, which is called involution. Involution. You, you um, think that? Plotinus called it efflux. Yeah. And then the return is evolution, and he called it reflux. Yeah. It's return. And what you find in, in, in a whole lot of metaphysicians, including even, even Ola Binder. What, what do you think? Oh, okay, I'll get to that. <laughs> but you get the sense that they sort of think that every single thing that exists now um, is a product. It actually was manifest as spirit through itself outwards. So it's actually up there someplace. So I hate so that idea. Hugh, I don't, I don't, I, but Houston Smith would say, well, there, those are archetypes, and, and, and then when something new emerges on Earth, the archetype falls down from heaven and pops into existence. Yeah, I go, but why would you say that? Totally idiotic. Yeah. Um, but, what, but here's, the, here's the question. We can make a legitimate assumption based on common Satori experiences and, and how people tend to find, tend to interpret those and what they what yeah. tend to say those mean. Yeah. Um, that there is some type of ground of being yeah. and that it is manifesting all of this. Yeah. And all of this is, is very much sort of one with it, but yeah. it is this outflow. Yeah, definitely. So the question is, there is this extraordinary, I'll just call it spirit capital S. Yeah. And then does it, it, if it's throwing itself out just in terms of the amount of reality or the degree of being or whatever it is, doesn't that step down in some sense? Or is everything that's manifest out here also just spirit and there's no difference between the two? Or does it step up? And what, what strikes me about our understanding the kind of scientific myth, if you like, the, the story we have now, is it's such a coherent story, albeit, you know, the beginnings of a story, in which we're stepping up. So you've got from the sort of coming in and out of potentiality you can see in quantum physics through to these building blocks, which will emerge on these higher levels and transcend each other. And, and it's such an elegant story because it's all there right in front of you. And then this level that you and I are experiencing of, let's say, psyche or soul or mind, all those names, has come from that. Now, obviously, it's implicit in it, but I don't know where it needs to be as, uh, before yeah. the whole process. Well, what I think has happened is... Yes, what do you think? That's what I want okay. to hear. Um, I think, I think it, it makes an enormous amount of sense to say okay. that in, in, in metaphoric terms, spirit is throwing itself outward and, in a certain sense, downward. Okay. It's not, and I don't. I don't even care in in this part of the story, whether you include potentiality in in spirit or not. If okay. you want to, it's fine with me yeah. on yeah. this part of the story. So yeah. you could say, well, spirit is that what has more potential than but, anything. But what's those it can levels create more than anything else that are there before? There's there's, the, there's nothing. The, just ever present spirit. From yeah. All time and, then and it all comes places. down. So if we're going to say, among other things, that spirit is spirit because it has more potential than any other thing anywhere in the world. So yeah. it's stepping down in amount of potentiality that can be the number of creative different things that it can do. And so when you get down to matter, for example, you can, a good physicist can tell you where Jupiter will be 100 years from now. Yeah. Uh, the best biologist in the world can't tell you where a dog will be a minute from now. Okay, so, so for me, what dog that has more to, creativity. Yeah, so what that points to to me isn't any of this stuff which was the great chain of being and the way we thought of it then, it feels like, look, there is, let's, there is something which is potential and spirit. I like sure. spirit. Spirit's a good word. Which is manifesting itself, probably based on the past, but manifesting itself in this unique way, in, a, in, in the most simplistic ways. And the potentiality doesn't get any less. It's always infinite and it's sure. here right now. Sure. It's just that what it's got to work with right now is your mind. Whereas what it had to work with then was hydrogen. And so it's more repetitive, right. it's less creative, and it'll take a long time to develop. Now it's developing as we speak. Yeah. Now I think that part is true. And I think, I think the only thing that's actually getting manifest when this happens is since we've at least agreed that it's going from some sort of infinite, vast, unqualifiable potentiality. Yeah. And then whatever shows up down here, the quarks or atoms yeah. or uh, protons, neutrons, they don't have nearly that kind of creativity. They don't even have life forms in them. But what we do have is this difference. Yeah. There's this vast morphogenetic field yeah. that almost acts like 
um, if you have a rock and then put a rubber band in your hand and, and then let it go, the rock is hanging on that rubber band and then you just hit it and it starts swinging back foot. And what it does do though is it slowly gets pulled up by the thing. Now, I don't think it's getting pulled up through levels that are there already formed. Right? I don't think it's getting pulled up to a body that has all of these fixed characteristics yeah. of biology. And then it gets pulled up to a mind that has all of these already existing, already fixed, yeah. that were created in evolution. I don't think that happened. They don't they have an evolution that created this broad morphogenetic field of differentials. There has to be something that happened in evolution. And conversely, some field that evolution is moving towards. It's moving towards something. And if it looks like it's moving towards something good, then the ultimate of that good is spirit. So there's a rubber band that's pulling it in a sense in that direction. Okay. Okay. So you're okay, so, so and all we find is these gradations. Going up. So you're saying it's you're saying the involution is kind of like the blueprint for what will be the return journey it's, in some um, way. It's a tilt. And I think I'm, what I'm saying is, is that necessary? Using Occam's razor. Well, like, yeah, do, well that's do we my need, point. Do we well, need that, that? But that's what I'm doing. I'm taking away what's necessary from involution. Right. And that is acknowledge the difference between spirit and matter. Yeah. Even though matter is a form of spirit. Yeah. Got it. But then, as spirit itself has qualities, as it's saguna Brahman, then it is different from just matter. Okay, so for me, the saguna, one of the things for me was I'm going to use the word God because it's the yeah. same. But is sure. that what was going was a moment where I went, oh look, if I put this being of love and oneness and all that at the beginning of time, yeah. it doesn't work, which is why so many people have become atheists because problem of evil, you know, in all its forms. And he's an idiot. I mean, why would you go, you know, why would you create a universe and go through all of this and 125 million years of dinosaurs? It's like, he's a mean son of a bitch and he's not the God I experienced. But if I take him and put him at the end, or rather, if I go, God is that saguna, it's not where it's coming from, it's where it's going. Suddenly, it redeems everything. Right. Because it's, it's moving towards that. Right. And now it's here, because we can experience it. Well, here's where you use Occam's razor. Um, in terms of what's actually there or not at the beginning, yeah, um, we, we certainly acknowledge that that ultimate infinite potential spirit yeah. is there. That's the that's ground. the ground is all the way right. through. Yeah. So then the question is, in terms of just the manifest realm itself, just just the yeah. shadows that start yeah. to show up, do they show any directionality at all? Because if they do, well, here's, the, here's the direction. There's two things. What, one of the directionalities is simply, well, the phrase I like to use is kind of it, it, it's something. I think Rupert Sheldrake is is responsible for this years ago. But is that the past doesn't pass; it accumulates. So that, that there's more and more past all the time. So well, each moment transcends and includes. Inclu the exactly, time. exactly. By, by the way, can I just tell you, I think that's one of the most beautiful phrases Great. I've ever come across. Great. So each moment transcends and, and, and each previous moment is, precedes and supports it. Yes, absolutely. So that you've got this. And so that's the, 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 there's going to be a tendency towards emergence, towards evolution. Because absolutely. it's just building Order up. out of chaos. Um, of course, the other thing which kind of blurs it is my, my sense personally is, if you, you know, obviously with the anthropic problem that you know it's so well set up and all of that stuff and yeah. Roger Penrose's thing that 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 I'm, my personal approach would be to say well probably what that means is we're not the first universe and that the universe is doing what other universes is done which is why it has a directionality because same reason is that Tim turned into a human being because it's re repeating the past in a creative way because that's what the whole of reality is it's a repeat of the past in a creative way and that that was a simpler way of understanding a process which enables us to, to keep with this thing which I'm playing with as a hypothesis here, which is what reality is, is that formless thing you're pointed so beautifully to, realizing itself. And that, sure. And that, that's what it, you know, and that, that's it. <laughs> sure, and, and in terms of what actually is showing up down there at just that early material dimension, which is basically just, a spirit throws itself hard, you know, in, in, in outward, and, and he says, I'm mean, just is low and dense and ignorant and is not living in his own conscious. I can get wherever that stops, it's a quark or electron or yeah, proton or yeah, whatever the hell. Yeah, the first thing. But that does have this, there's already an inherent tendency to wind up. Yes. It's not just going to run down. But is, I think that's in the process of time, isn't it? Realization. Just the thing about it. It doesn't matter right now. We're just saying it's there, it's there. at okay. the beginning. Okay, yeah. 
And so then you can use Occam's razor, and you can say, okay, well, now how much, how do we actually want to describe what's actually there, what it's actually doing? Is it a drive toward, is it just more order, that's it? Is, is it order that's more unified? Yeah. Or is it more whole? Yeah. Does that also end up meaning more conscious? Because Viet du Whitehead prehension goes all the way down. So there's a little bit of proto-awareness in electrons and turns, and I believe that. They okay, have. so 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 the, the way So that, just what are we calling this uh, winding up? We already call it greater order, greater um, uh, unity, greater wholeness, greater consciousness. Those are happening at day one. Yes. They are. Fine. Then that and then I'm willing to sort of stop there. These whole mental things and the reason the anthropic principle isn't that big a problem is that all you're measuring with anthropic principles are just the material, ex exterior, material, objective things or something. You're yeah. not saying, oh, and here are the universal laws that govern how all thinking works. Those, that, those are merged. Those are new. Exactly. That's the way it looks to be, that there are certain things which are there right at the beginning, which come from the very essence of what it is, that will just continue to evolve. you've done is something interesting. You've actually shown sort of this interpenetration. You actually show how it requires a particular complexification of gross matter energy in order for the subtle energies to begin to come into expression in the manifest universe. And then also there's particular, probably, uh, complex complexifications of that gross and subtle energy, which then yeah. allows causal energy to be generated, transmitted, received, however we want to, right. we want to visualize it. So right. that sort of holonic, you know, each of these energies sort of, you know, transcludes, but depends on the more fundamental levels, I think is a, is a really um, important insight that came through all of yes. this. And that does also bring in the whole notion of involution and evolution. Yeah. Yep. Because what involution is, is, I mean, if you just sort of just abstractly think uh, conceptualization, so we don't know how accurate it'll be. But if you just think of there being spirit, and then at the other end, matter, how are these connected? So if you have the big bang and there's just spirit and it just pow blows out just matter at the other end, what's connecting them? And this is where involution comes in. Mm. It's when matter throws itself out, it throws itself out in just a broad morphogenetic field all the way down that connects to matter. Mm. Because matter is, according to the traditions, nothing but a manifestation of spirit. So how does that manifest? Well, I maintain in a, it just throwing it out in a, it's still connected, mm -hmm. but in a great morphogenetic field. And that morphogenetic field is always going to exert a pull back on matter. So it's, it takes care of, oh, where did life come from? We can't figure that out. It pulled matter along for about 10 billion years. And then the first cell emerged. And it pulled that along until multicellular animals emerged. Mm -hmm. And then it pulled that and it's continuing to pull that. And so you can pull it all the way back to a direct realization of spirit with a satori or an enlightenment or an awakening or something like that. And then you are a bodhisattva. Right. So in terms of how much does this morphogenetic field contain, that's one of the questions that we is open to discussion. But I think that Again, if you think of just a morphogenetic field, not as having rigid levels, but just certain um, densities, increasing densities or bumps or something very generalized like that, that it does sort of bump up 
as you move from spirit to soul. Mm -hmm. And it does sort of bump up as you move from soul to mind. And it does simply bump up as you move from mind to body. And it does sort of bump up when you move from body, from body into mind. And since that hits the bottom shelf, of course, spirit could grow, throw itself out endlessly. But at some point, it stops. Mm -hmm. So we'll stop it here, where it takes around 14 billion years to get back. That seems like a pretty long throw out to me. Um, then as it comes back, it's pulled by these higher bumps, mm -hmm. or just fluctuations in the morphogenetic field. Mm -hmm. Now, how much you else you want to add to what goes down in evolution, that's an open topic. You can say, for example, in as soon as mind emerges, that it has archetypes, which the Greeks called the first forms to emerge in awareness in which all other forms are based on. And those archetypes could include the whole of mathematics, not just the square root of a negative one running around, but just mathematics as a whole mm. could be a potential that's dropped off there. So could logic. Mm -hmm. These are two things that we generally agree you can't get just from looking at sensory world. Um, and so on down, it could go. Um, Houston Smith, for example, thinks absolutely everything that shows up in the manifest world is has a form in involution hmm. that creates it. I think that's a little bit much because if that were the case, then these people like Orbindo or so on that were said to have access to this involutionary stepping down. And they always described what was in the manifest world. They always left out things that exist today. So there were no computers, no airlines, no cars, no internet. Where did they? Why aren't they showing up? If, if everything that shows up is present and in relation. So I don't think it's, you have to draw it that tightly. And this is also where evolution plays a role because as evolution itself starts to unfold, it's creating itself various forms. Mm -hmm. And these forms do alter the possibilities of the higher. So one of the things that integral post metaphysics tries to do is take all of the things that traditional involution used to include and used to say, okay, this was produced on its way down. And then all of this went unconscious. And the only thing aware was matter. And then matter unfolded back into living bodies and living bodies back into minds and all of that. What integral metaphysics does is takes most of the creative power away from the spiritual end and gives it to the evolutionary end. So that all the things that we see evolving, it's going to do so within the broad givens of the involutionary realm. And these are what we call involutionary givens. So things that show up immediately with a big bang, strong or weak nuclear, gravitational, electromagnetic, they're all involutionary givens. They didn't evolve. Interesting. But then as we continued to grow and move, more and more places came up where an evolution could fit in to any number of places and have different forms. And those was what 
would what would build. And so by the time we got to, for example, the red stage of development in humanity's own evolution, it could have gone several different ways, but it, because of its own evolutionary drive, it unfolded in a particular way. And once it unfolded, it became a cosmic habit. And so it was available to all other people. And then it, as it continued to evolve, it set the possibilities of the next higher stage, which was amber ethnocentric mythic stage of development and so on. So that to me at least covers the whole evolutionary involutionary curve. And if we're going to say just evolution occurred, then you do run into the problem that Whitehead and several other philosophers referred to as the miracle of emergence. So if it's, if, if it's just evolution with no involution before it, then it can do anything it wants. And, but when a lower level like matter produces a higher level like a living cell, you've got a bitch of a problem figuring out how to get the higher from the lower. Right. And they still, science is nowhere close to figuring that out. Yep, because there's new sums that are, that are greater than the sum of the parts. There's new Absolutely. totalities that are greater than the sum of the, of the parts. Yeah. yeah, and that's definitely true. Mm. So that takes care of a lot of problems uh, even though they're just abstract and they're not material living forms that you can empirically test and study. And that's what I mostly try to follow mm -hmm. because I want to be as quote, scientifically acceptable as possible. Um, but there are just some areas that present such recalcitrantly difficult problems that we just can't figure them out mm -hmm. without having some form of involution. And involution is not a hard thing to think about if you accept the existence of a ground of all being and a farthest removed piece of material from it. What are they going to do? Just not talk to each other? <laughs> no, it's going to get pulled back. And that generally means following the same path that it showed up as. Mm. So I, I think that's a fairly significant part of, of evolution evolution. And it does mean that every point of evolution you're undergoing is a push-pull. Um, right. The previous evolution is exerting a pull yep. on it. Great. A lot of this comes up in, in future questions that you are uh, setting us up for brilliantly, Ken. So thank you. We'll, we'll yeah. return to a lot of this, um, particularly uh, some of the challenges that um, folks commonly have when, when visualizing the sure. relationship between uh, evolution and involution. We'll, we'll we'll get back to this, and we've got a couple, we've got a couple fun questions about you know how exactly emergence works, what what right. populates these different realms before something is able to emerge in the evolutionary record. Um, we'll get we'll get back to all that soon. There's going to be some really fun questions in the second half okay. of this conversation. So um, thank you.